Hi everybody, it's Mr. Matthew here, and in this video we're going to talk about disruptions to ecosystems. Specifically, we're going to talk about how evolution is characterized by changes in the genetic makeup of a population over time, and how that's supported by multiple lines of evidence, and how the competition and cooperation are important aspects of biological systems. So basically, we're going to talk about the conditions that exist within populations, and then how disruptions influence the shifts of those populations. All right, let's get to it. So I'm gonna explain the interactions between the environment and random or pre-existing variations in a population. So first off, it's important to note that all populations have variation. So that in every single population that you look at, you're going to see that for certain traits, there's gonna be ranges of phenotypes for any of the polygenic characteristics. There'll also be variation in Mendelian traits, but those tend not to have the same broad swath of variation, but every population is going to have wide ranges in variation of any polygenic trait. It's also important to know that what we'll see is that the environmental conditions are not 100% constant. So I have this uh, diagram of from the 1800s, late 1800s, where they had inches of rainfall collected, and then what they had is they had the tree growth and what you can see is that season to season or year to year, there was varying amounts of rainfall that took place. And as a result, there, that had an impact on tree growth. And so what we need to know is that the tree population had variation in it. Some of the trees were going to do better in high rainfall situations. Some of them would do better in low rainfall situation. And because of that variation, what you end up seeing is that different members of the population were successful under different conditions. And so the pre-existing variation of the trees led there to be survivability of the overall population as the environment shifted. So the other thing to know is that adaptation is a genetic variation that favors the selection and manifestation as a trait that provides an advantage to an organism in a particular environment. So again, a trait is not particularly inherently good or bad. Uh, we've talked about the rock pocket mice in other conditions, and this is a good example where we have two variants. We have the lighter brown variant, and we have the darker, almost black variant. And in the environments where you find rocket pocket mice, you find them in these areas in the southwest United States where there are large black lava flows with some lighter soil around them. Now, if you find a mouse and it is in the dark lava flows, the variant that is going to be more successful is going to be the darker variant. If you find one of these lighter browns, the lighter brown allele frequency is going to be much lower in the dark lava flows and they are selected against. So over time, what you end up seeing is that certain variants are either selected for or selected against, depending on the environmental conditions where you find these species. So the other thing to know is that the variation source is random. The mutations that lead to those variations is not caused by the environment. So the environment being light or dark does not cause the mutations. The mutations occur randomly and create variation, and that it is not directed by the environmental pressure. The environment will do the selection after the variation has occurred. So what you will find is that the mutation rate that generates, say, the dark mice is going to occur at a certain rate, regardless of whether the environment is dark or light. Now, the population will have a high allele frequency of dark alleles if dark survive, the dark mice survive and reproduce better. But that is a rise in allele frequency that's not to be confused by the rise due to mutations. The creation of those variations is a random event and not directed by the environment itself. The environmental pressure leads to how the population shifts in the allele frequency after the mutations have created that initial variation. So how do invasive species affect ecosystem dynamics? So we again have a picture here of purple loosestrife in a wetland environment. And on the surface, what we would see is that purple loosestrife, very successful in New England wetlands, not native to this area, very successfully at competing with uh, swamp milkweed, very effective at competing with cattails. These are very common uh, native species that normally would be in this wetland, but in, as you can see in this wetland, it's been overtaken completely by purple loosestrife. So how does that invasive species affect the dynamics? Well, obviously it's going to have a direct impact on the cattail and swamp milkweed populations. 
But because the population is going to have an interrelatedness that over here we can see these are swamp milkweeds and they are being pollinated by monarch butterflies. So with a loss of the swamp milkweed, we may end up seeing a loss of the monarch. If the monarch is not able to utilize the purple loosestrife to gain energy, then what we will see is a loss of those. And in fact, that is a case what we're seeing is that there are certain native species that rely specifically on swamp milkweed that cannot shift over its energy to it, and therefore the monarchs will decline in that area. You'll see certain other types of moths and certain other caterpillars also are reduced. And what we also see on the lower right here is the red-winged blackbird. And the red-winged blackbird utilizes the cattail as a environment where you tend to see them uh, nesting, using their seeds. They tend to feed on insects that are there. And so the energy requirements have shifted so that the, you're not going to see the same numbers of red-winged blackbirds in an area uh, because there's less overall food. So invasive species cause a shift in what the dominant species of an area is and will ov overall have an impact on the food web. Depending on the success of that invasive species will depend on how rapidly the food web will shift. So it's also noted that the intentional or unintentional introduction of an invasive species can allow the species to exploit new niches free of predators or competitors or to outcompete uh, other organisms for resources. And so what I want to talk about is an example of an unintentional introduction. Uh, purple loosestrife was brought over specifically for ornamental purposes, um, as have many plants in the Northeast that we end up seeing, and then they sort of escaped captivity, if you will. Uh, but zebra mussels is an example where using ship's ballasts, what would happen is we would have a large container ship that would come over, and what you'd notice is that this ship is heavily covered by these containers that are bringing uh, materials from one place to another. When they get to their destination and they unload those areas, the boat would go up and what they do is they take water into their ballasts. As a result of taking water into their ballasts, what they ended up doing in certain areas is they took on these little tiny zebra mussels. And these zebra mussels, then when they were brought over with shipping containers, um, were unintentionally released into areas like the... Mississippi River, like Lake Michigan, and uh, other places throughout the United States where they were unintentionally introduced. In those areas, they did not have the native com competitors. And so what we can see is that they started covering and competing for areas to live, and they crowded out native bivalve species that might be a native food source. And so Again, these very small, successful zebra mussels have come in and out competed because of the accidental introduction into a new area. So coming back to the idea of our population growth, the availability of resources can result in uncontrolled population growth and ecological changes. And so when we have something like a zebra mussel or in this picture here, a kudzu, what we'll end up seeing is that they first get introduced, they will undergo some slow growth. Again, if environmental conditions are correct, not every introduced species is going to undergo these only certain species are going to be able to do this, but if they are, they can undergo this very fast growth. Now, if this fast growth is not kept in check by certain types of herbivores or certain types of predators, things that could put a restriction on it, what you may find is that it is going to rapidly grow and therefore it will choke out or outcompete native species. Now, eventually some resource will become limiting. In the case of kudzu, it actually seems to physically be land. And eventually once they've covered all of the land they could cover, they will start to slow their growth and you will see them reaching their carrying capacity. The difference is, is that while they're doing this, they may reach a very high carrying capacity and outcompete other species for materials during that rise in population. So how does human activities lead to changes in ecosystem and structure and dynamics? Well, obviously we already talked about how introducing species would do that. We also know that um, human activities through the burning of fossil fuels has led to uh, land and ocean temperatures rising. We also see that as a result of this, we're starting to see uh, sea levels are rising as well. And so what we're seeing here is that this is an example where coastal communities are now seeing shifts in the amount of flooding. We're also seeing the rise in the amount of um, mixing of salt and fresh water in certain ecosystems. And so we can see that through climate change, we are dramatically having an impact uh, on uh, all 
areas of the world through temperature shift, but also very heavily hitting coastal ecosystems. We also know that we are having the ability through development to break apart and fragment habitats. So here we have a logging road. And what you can see is we've cut this road here, where now we've separated what was once a continuous ecosystem by putting a road in between it. Now, some species like a bird species is going to be able to fly over that road. It will be unaffected. But if you are a land species and now you have a highway that is separated two areas, that may have a profound impact on the ability for members of a population to survive and reproduce. It's also reducing the potential land for individuals to, uh, to grow and to harvest food. And so both through habitat fragmentation and through uh, habitat development for human usage, we're going to end up seeing loss of ecosystems. Now, the disruption of local or global ecosystems change over time. And so we know that ecosystems in particular, when you disturb a habitat, it will undergo through a series of succession steps where, you know, you first have barren rock or free soil, and then you will get things like mosses and lichens come in, and then some small plants, and then eventually larger plants, and then ultimately you can get to a large tree canopy. And so we know for a fact that that given there are own time frame, uh, we will see this natural succession of ecosystems, particularly around here. We also know that we're disrupting um, ecosystems to develop them for something like farmland. But we'll also find areas, particularly in this area, where once upon a time there were farms everywhere. And over the last 200 years, a lot of those farms have gone back to native forest land. So if you're ever walking in the woods and all of a sudden you come across a stone wall, the kind that you would expect to border a field that separates two fields that are growing grass or growing crops. That may have actually been the case that 200, 250 years ago, there was a stone wall separating two people's property that were separating two farms. And because that development has been abandoned and succession has taken place, uh, plants have returned to the canopy state from before human development, chopped them down and turned them into farming. So we end up seeing that um, both disruption to local and global, e global ecosystems will change over time. So some of the human activities that accelerate changes to local ecosystem. Uh, again, introduction of new diseases that can devastate native species on this lower left-hand side. I, what I'm showing you here is the uh, example of chestnut blight. Chestnuts used to be a major plant used in the lumber industry, uh, but accidentally introducing a fungus from overseas caused there to now be very few mature chestnut plants. And in fact, the, the blight is killing them. This is very similar to Dutch Elms disease with both elms and chestnut plants, by introducing invasive invasive fungi, we have accidentally uh, introduced a pathogen that kills those two species of plants, and we see very few mature versions of those. It's been you know hundreds of millions, if not billions, of dollars in the lumber industry over the last hundred years through the accidental introduction of those species. We also know that habitat can change due to human activity. In addition to the climate change example that I gave you before, uh, another profound area is how we monitor water by pre creating dams uh, to create reservoirs. This is going to both create new novel pools of water, which can serve as habitats, but it will also dramatically impact the flow of water downstream, oftentimes changing the rate of flow, also the amount of water that's going to flow afterwards. We have seen that this has had a profound impact on many fish species, particularly in the northwest United States, um, areas where salmon once spawned and now their streams have been massively changed. And we know that there's a variety of reasons by changing these for human activities to harness the water. Uh, we've had a profound impact on the species that would naturally have occurred in those unchanged habitats. So how does geological and meteorological activity lead to changes in ecosystems and structure or dynamics? So obviously there are the natural processes, things like uh, volcanoes and, and natural weather. But again, humans have had a profound impact through the increase in temperature and the rise in sea levels. And so uh, what we have is we have receding glaciers, as you can see here, due to climate change, where glaciers that once covered much larger 
uh, swaths of land have melted and eroded. And now what we're seeing is these areas of rock that were once covered by glaciers through human activity and the rise of temperatures has led to a much less sort of ice and also much more barren rock. We also can see the uh, coastline. There are many estimates that uh, southern Florida and areas all along the coast of Florida um, are going to be profoundly impacted by the rise in sea levels that's a associated with both climate change and sea level rise that is going to be coming in the next hundred years. So uh, we can see how the changes of our meteorological impact are ultimately going to change uh, the location and storage of water and how that's going to have an impact on the land. All right, so we also know that geological and meteorological events affect habitat change and ecosystem distribution. And so, again, some of the natural changes, we know that the continents have moved. We know that at times there were land bridges along the Bering Strait uh, between modern-day Alaska and Russia. Uh, we also know that uh, we've been able to track these changes over time. And one specific example of a type of species that we've seen um, change over time is the change of camels. And so through looking at the fossil record and looking at the overall change and distribution of camel groupings, it turns out that camel families likely evolved first in an area that would be in the northwest plains and maybe an area like Montana. And they have found fossilized uh, camel ancestors in Montana um, in here. And then by tracking the change of fossils over time, along with the migratory patterns that track to both the geological fossil record and also the various climates of those uh, places over time, we've been able to track the movement of camels to modern day camels and also modern day llamas and how those have changed over the last several uh, tens of millions of years. All right, so that was a lot of information about uh, changes in environment and its link to evolutions and population change. I hope that was helpful, and I'll talk to everybody soon.